And I heard the other guy say, yeah, but what's the margin? Mm -hmm. And I was like, I got them. So I always say cash is everything until cash is not an issue. And so that obsession, and we really were able to dramatically increase our margin over time. But like I said, it was very small incremental changes just compounded on each other for years. Welcome to Inspired by Success, the podcast where I deep dive into the mindset of successful entrepreneurs, CEOs, and thought leaders. Get ready to be inspired and gain valuable insights to unlock your true potential. Today, we're joined by a serial entrepreneur and founder of Finn Elevate. From tackling cash flow challenges in his family business to scaling and diversifying his ventures, he's navigated the entrepreneurial landscape with resilience and wisdom. Recognized as the go to person for financial strategy, he now cha- channels his expertise to help businesses thrive. Join us as he shares his insights and the financial wisdom gained from his journey. Welcome to the show, Colin Sandberg. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Awesome. Tell us about your story and a little bit about what you do. Oh, well, like many of us, uh, the story is long. I'll try and tell you a little bit of it. So I, you know, to your point, I got started at 21 years old in, in a family business. It wasn't a business that I intended to be in for very long. I actually had before that um, realized that I wanted to be an entrepreneur. And that was my, my journey and uh, found the person nearest to me who had a, a small business and went to work there. And originally thought I'd be there for a year or two and then go do my own thing. And here I am 22, 23 years later, and I still own that company. <laughs> and so um, like many things in life, you know, the, my entrepreneur journey is, has been a, a lot of twists and turns. But, you know, going back to what you said, I, I started in that business and just kind of a generic, you know, help anywhere that uh, help is needed type of role and pretty quickly gravitated to the financial side of the business, not because I had any special skill, but because there was a very um, significant need within the business. And as I got into it, realized that the business was really struggling. And that was new information to me, but it was, you know, something that was pretty immediately obvious once I got in. And so even though I didn't have any idea how to solve those problems, that set the course for the next, you know, five to 10 years of my life and my career was trying to figure out how I was going to help uh, fix that business. Yes, because a lot of the times entrepreneurs just go into it and they don't have a finance or like a business background and they do it. And and me personally, I could say that... <laughs> There's been a lot of roller coasters up and down, especially with cash flow and managing that. And I still, I'm still winging it now, <laughs> learning as I improve. Yep. But three yep. years on, I'm, you know, there's still roller coasters because you can't predict things, sales and whatnot. And so that's why I'm super excited to have you on board as well. I mean, to to interview you and just find out, you know, all this knowledge that we can get from like financial world of small businesses. So, what financial metrics matter mostly for small businesses just starting starting out? Mm. You know, you, you kind of hit the nail on the head. I think really the, probably the first one is cash flow. So I always say cash is everything until cash is not an issue. And if it's, you know, if it is something that you're dealing with and struggling with, it's, it's all consuming. And so for most small businesses, especially if you're starting from a, a position of having limited resources, you have to figure out the cash flow piece quickly or else you won't survive long enough to figure out the other problems. Yeah, that's true. I've heard this so many times. A lot of businesses and entre- like entrepreneurs, the founders, a lot of the times they don't pay themselves for the first few years sometimes, you know, or the first year, and they're just constantly reinvesting the profits back into the businesses. So um, do you have any advice for that? And should people systemize it in a way like, is there a strategy that you can give us in terms of budgeting and, you know, how much percentage allocation should we be paying ourselves? Like any tips on that as well? Yeah, I, th- I think the, the best uh, advice I've seen on that front is to, you know, do a little research as to what it would take for you to hire someone to replace you. And you may not be able to afford to pay yourself that, but you need to take a look at your financials, assuming you had made that payment. And, and that's the, the, the big harm in not paying yourself other than just the challenge in your personal life is that it can lead people to say things like, hey, we're breaking even or we're making a little bit of money when in fact they're not paying themselves anything. And so if that's the case, you're not actually breaking even. You're not actually making a little bit of money. You would be losing if you had to hire someone to replace yourself. And so once you're thinking about your business as its own entity and not really just, you know, you Inc., then it requires you to say, look, the business has to truly make money even with paying someone to run it. 
Yeah, so because I've heard on other podcasts that I follow too, they always, Ryan Pineda, he's one of my favorites, he always talks about as soon as he buys a business, he actually finds an operator straight away to yep. take over there. Yep. And then that way he scales as well. But, you know, that that's a certain level you have to achieve before you can go, go there as well. So first of all, how can business owners systemize finances to spend less time on them? Yeah, that's a, that's a fantastic question. So there's a lot of tools that are out there now. I, I would say that for the average entrepreneur, don't use the ability to get more efficient as an excuse to be less engaged with your numbers. So that's not exactly the answer you asked me for, but I would just say that as a you know prerequisite as you go down that path of trying to get more efficient is don't use that as the excuse to not look at your numbers for a week or a month or however long. There's a lot of tools, even just baked into like QuickBooks Online, um, the ability to reconcile either credit cards or banks right there in the flow um, and do that through bank feeds with a, a live kind of up to the minute connection with your accounts. That's a huge thing um, to get things categorized more accurately and giving people kind of a quick snapshot on what's working. Yeah, I totally agree there because I wasn't using Zero for a while and I was using Excel sheets with my bookkeeper. It was too manual. It took too long, but Zero and the software just, it's a total game changer. So I think every business should have that early on in the start of their business. So how often do you recommend checking out the numbers and going through it? Because, you know, like some people leave it to each quarter, some people do it yeah. six months, yeah. every month maybe. Like it is a task, like you have to do it um, to to look at the P&L and see, you know, where the money is going and the profit and loss. But yeah, how often should somebody be like the founders be doing that? Yeah, that's a, that's a fantastic question. So I, I think the way to look at it is when you're looking at your numbers, thinking about the nature of your real business and understanding under, over what time period do your numbers actually mean something. And I, I've seen that, like, for example, I've got one business that I'm an owner of, and w I'm really focused on what that business is able to accomplish over a quarter because it's a big project-based business. It doesn't make sense to obsess over what's happening every week and sometimes even every month. Of course, I'm looking at the numbers, but I'm really obsessing over what the quarters look like. I have another business that is much more of a manufacturing plant and it's generating product every week. And so I'm interested in what's happening on a weekly basis in that. I'm looking at what the revenue is, what are the expenses, we have payroll that's happening every week. It allows us to kind of get that business into a weekly view. And so really, I would say first and foremost, understand the nature of your business you don't want to be looking, and I think this is one of the traps that entrepreneurs fall into. That would be kind of my advice. And, you know, generally speaking, cash at least weekly, especially in the early stages, sometimes cash daily, just to understand really what's where your cash balance looking is. Looking at your profit and loss really clearly on at least a monthly basis. And then your balance sheet all the way through deep dive on the financials, the PL, the balance sheet, at least quarterly. That's a great advice there. And um, I I just want to be transparent. Like when I first started my business e-commerce as well, like I, I got in myself into a lot of debt because I spent a lot on ads and agencies and therefore mm -hmm. that was a bad, bad move. So now, you know, like I've just, I had too many, like I had two credit cards. So spending on stock and stuff plus the agencies plus ad and that left me in a lot of debt. So I'm just, I cut back one of the credit cards because the interest rate was going crazy and um, managing that the payments was a bit hard and I'm because I like to see myself as the sales and marketing like the finance part I was always like oh I don't like the numbers and I, I used yeah. to get help on that you know can you give any tips and advice on how you know like small businesses or even large businesses can you know manage their debt correctly because I thought I like I thought oh, what, a, what a failure you know but then I realized you know what so there's so many businesses, even massive companies that go out of debt and that's because of mismanagement of money and even governments mismanage money too. So, yep. you know, like finance is, it's not an easy thing, especially managing budgets and managing your debt. So can you yeah, give absolutely. any advice on that? Yeah. I, I felt really bad about it, but then I realized so many businesses, so big common, companies right? going out, yeah, going out of, yeah, um, yeah out of business. So Yeah, so one of the first too. ones. Yeah. One of the first ones I would recommend, and it's true no matter what type of organization you are, is match the type of debt that you're taking on to the, the type of use. And so when I say that, what you find a lot is people who are in trouble with debt is because they're putting things on credit card that really should have been a line of credit, for example. 
line of credit compared to credit cards is way cheaper. Even with high interest rates that we're dealing with now, it's significantly cheaper than what you're paying with a credit card. And so just matching the, the right type of spin and the right type of debt to the right instrument that you're using um, is the first one toward keeping you out of trouble. The other thing that's interesting is, you know, the, the similarly, like a line of credit, a bank wants to see that rotate. They don't want to see, they call it a revolving line of credit. They don't want to see the, it go to $50,000 and then stay at $50,000 for six months straight. And then you hopefully pay it all the way off. They really want to see it go up to 10. It goes down to five. It goes up to 15. It goes down to zero. It goes up to 22, yeah. comes down to 12. You know, they want to see it move. And that shows them that it's accomplishing what it's supposed to, which is not covering up losses but it's actually advancing cash into the business for things that are already uh, being sold. And so that's the other one I would tell you is just be really cautious. Are you taking on debt because you're, you're advancing cash or are you taking on debt because you're losing money? And the second one I can never ad advocate for. You've got to get to where you're profitable and you've got to fight with everything you've got to get and stay profitable. Wow, that's definitely very, very powerful there. Let's talk about scaling and a little bit about your background as well because you know what you've got you scaled multiple businesses what's the most important financial lesson you've learned from scaling your first business well i think i just touched on it is um get profitable so one of my my first business that i i dealt with it was kind of a turnaround story it was the the finances were really a mess and you know before i could even figure out how to solve all those problems I recognize that, look, if we're not making money, this problem gets worse and worse. And there's that old saying, you know, what do you do when you find yourself in a hole? And the first thing you do is stop digging. And so I had to stop digging the hole, right? We had to stop losing money because all of our cash problems, all of the fact that we were having a hard time getting paid for things or that we had the wrong kind of inventory, every one of those problems were ultimately solved through the same thing, which is profit. They had to be solved through profit. Now, some of them took years to solve, but it all began with obsessing over, I want to make money on every deal we do. And so it was, you know, this was in a manufacturing kind of construction company. We sold parts for uh, airport conveyor systems, like what you claim your bag off of. And so when those, when those deals would come across my desk, no matter how small or how big the deal was, I looked at every single quote we did, every single order we did. And I asked, is this profitable? Is there a way we could sell it for more? Is there a way we could buy it for cheaper? I mean, really just super basic, but doing that over every single quote, every single sale for years, it completely changed the nature of our company and our margins doubled in a period of about five years. And it was because we just kind of were buying and selling smarter and obsessing over every little deal. Like, Hey, I don't care if it's $10, we can't lose money on a $10 deal was kind of the mentality. Definitely a good thing to think about because, you know, there are some parts in businesses that you do expect to lose some money in. Um, and if you can just make sure you go through with a, like a, just granularly go through each one, um, then it will definitely, I do like that concept because, you know, as, as a business owner myself, we have so much different stock and, and some are profitable margins. This is one mistake that I made when I first started is just not looking into the margins and how important margins are, you know? So, yeah. um, how did you manage to double, like increase your margins by 50%? That's, that's crazy. Yeah. So when I started, um, our margins were between 30 and 32%. And by the mm -hmm. time I was done, I actually got them up into the low, uh, sixties, probably 63%, let's say. And the way that I did that, like I said, was not some masterful idea. It was not this one big plan. It was every time a deal was brought to my desk, we would talk through like, what's the competition? What is this selling for? Can we squeak out more money? Is the customer shopping us, you know, and that's just on the revenue side. Right. And then we would turn around and say, okay, how much are we paying for this? How can we drop that cost? And there were things we were making that we should have been buying and things we were buying that we should have been making. 
And we, we unearthed all of that by literally talking deal by deal by deal by deal. And what was really fascinating is I did it as a measure of control and for me to learn, but it ended up really teaching my team a tremendous amount. And originally revenue was the only thing anybody talked about at the company was how big a deal was. And I knew it had clicked when I overheard somebody walk into another guy's office and say, Hey, we just got this deal. And he said the amount of the deal. And it was, a, for us, it was a pretty good sized deal. It was like, Hey, this is a $65,000 deal. And I heard the other guy say, yeah, but what's the margin? Mm -hmm. And I was like, I got him, you know? And I knew that from that moment forward, it became part of who we were as a company. And so that obsession, and we really were able to dramatically increase our margin over time. But like I said, it was very small incremental changes just compounded on each other for years. Wow. Yeah, definitely highlight the importance of looking at margins. Let's talk about you acquiring businesses and companies as well. So, you know, how did you prioritize acquiring other companies versus investing back into your own business? Because as a business owner myself, I want to expand as well, but because I've got vending machines and I want to buy more, but then, you know, how do you prioritize between, you know, your initial business and other businesses as well? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I look at it like this. I say that um, money is, is, should be a one-way street with a business. In other words, I want the money to come out of the business, but I never expect to have to put it back in. And that's obviously not true if we're doing a startup. But once I have a mature business, it should be profitable. It should be generating enough cash for itself. And, and I'm going to be safe with how much cash I need to hold within that business, right? Every business is a little bit different in terms of how much money it needs on hand. But once we hit that amount of money, anything over and above that, I should be able to take out of the business. And, and the business should never look for it to ever come back again. When I think about it that way, I look at that money that I pull out is capital. In other words, it's not income. So I've already, by the time we get to that point, I've already paid myself a salary. I already have enough money that I can live off of. And it doesn't mean I'm living a big lavish lifestyle, but it's enough money that I can get by and be comfortable and take a vacation and, and, and stock up a little bit of cash on my own. When the money comes out over and above that, and I call it capital, what I mean by that is it's meant for reinvestment. And since I kind of have this notion that I don't put money back in, I need something else to invest it in. And so it, it's a discipline. Like I said, when, when I described the hole that we were in, it took a lot of time. It took years to fill in, you know, stop digging, then fill in the hole, then get enough on top of the hole that I felt comfortable and then have excess beyond that to where we could take it out of the business and I could start to do other things. But that was kind of always my mindset. And it still is. That's still how I look at uh, cash within a business. Wow. Did you need, did you hire external help, like a CFO to help you get to where you were as well? Early days startup or did you manage no. all that? So, you know, the business um, always made sense to me through numbers. It's just kind of how my mind works. I'm a pretty number oriented person. Um, and so when I got in into business, when I was young, I fell in love with the, the financial side of business. And I would say that, you know, I was mentored through reading every book I can get my hands on about, you know, the financial side of business, as well as I had a really um, one of my earliest mentors who is still one of my mentors, who's my CPA which is really odd because he's very different than every CPA, other CPA I've ever met, but very wise man and gave me a lot of really, really good advice when I was young and, and eager and needed to hear it. And so I just became passionate about the financial side of business from that day forward. And, and really, you know, the financial part, it's intimidating to a lot of people who don't like numbers, but in reality, it's not overly complicated in a small business. It's really kind of good common sense, learning what you need to know, figuring out what perspective you need to have, and then just kind of having the discipline to implement. Wow. And what, what are the com com some of the common mistakes that uh, you made and or, or you see other business owners make too when they're starting out in their journey, like in their entrepreneurial journey? Yeah. One of them, and, and we've all made it at some point or another, but I, I try to really um, harp on it because I want people to, to hear it loud and clear and kind of think about this differently. We get in this mindset where we think we're about to grow. And so we start adding all of these costs associated mm. with this new business we're about to have any day now. And, mm. the, and the really hard part is that can crush a business if the, if the growth doesn't come the way you expected. 
And what I see more than zero growth is that you expect 50% growth. And so you staff up and you spend money and you do all the things that you think will make you ready. And then growth is 20%. Anybody else would be over the moon with 20% growth. They'd be ecstatic. But because you built for 50% growth, you're in trouble. And so it's a, it's a huge challenge to say, yeah, I understand that your business is about to grow. And I understand that you need more help to be able to support that growth. But you're going to have to find some other way in the short term besides hiring people and committing a bunch of money. Because the other problem is, let's say that it takes you a quarter uh, of the year to get prepared for growth. And then the growth is supposed to come the next quarter. Well, that means for that first quarter, you're probably going to lose money if you have enough people for 50% growth. So by a definition, now you're starting quarter two weekend because you've lost money. You've gone into basically into debt to try and uh, get ready for this big boom that's going to come. And then 20% comes instead of 50. Now you're in big trouble. You're losing money still. You just came off a quarter where you lost a lot of money. And now the entire company is compromised. So that's a big one is just being disciplined to fight through those, that urge to say, you know, kind of like, Hey, if I hire all these people, if I get ready, it's going to happen. Sometimes it doesn't. Mm. I've made that mistake before as well. So <laughs> like yeah. when I had my first agency, I thought, yep, we're going to scale massively. So I better buy a lot of stock and I bought heaps of stock and then the iOS update happened and it's like, oh no, well, a lot of stock sitting there. So it was just a big, big mistake as well. So totally yeah. understand. Um, let's talk about growth because you mentioned growth as well. What specific financial um, growth strategies have helped with most of your companies as well? Yeah, I, I would say, I mean, kind of to your point, you know, it really depends on what the sales and marketing approach for a given business is. I've had some businesses that are selling into big companies and that's a very different approach from like a marketing driven company, like what you have. So it's really just kind of understanding what the, um, what the, the different lever is for growth. But one thing that I like to do, so let, let's just say in, in your business, um, this may or may not be a perfect fit, but let's just say that you're an agency and you're producing a video. So if the, if you're an agency producing videos, I like to take what, what I call an operational common size, which just means a unit of measure that everyone in the business understands, right? So if we're making videos, everyone understands a video, but they may not understand how much is in the pipeline. They may not understand what's in the bank account. They may not understand, you know, how many people we have and how much work we can get done, but everybody understands what a video is. So what I like to do is take that unit of measure and apply it to every different level of the company. So in other words, it's not a pipeline of 20 different prospects. It's a pipeline of 32 different videos. And so that helps me understand like what would be the impact? Because when we say like, here's the pipeline and it's this amount of money, that's really hard for the operational team to understand what the impact would be. If we start thinking about it in that common unit that everyone understands, the whole business is run off of, now it starts to make sense. I mean, you can literally say how many videos worth of cash do I have in the bank? Because I know what my average video is. Yeah. And so it just all the way through, and again, it doesn't mean that your entire team knows all of those different details, but anybody who touches your business at any level can now speak a familiar common language. And it's really, really helpful to say like, Hey, we don't need more revenue. If we already have book deals, we need to get more videos done because that's mm -hmm. what becomes revenue. And so what is it going to take to get more videos done more quickly? I also think that helps motivate the team in a way that if we just talk about numbers, a lot of people who've never owned their own business think that, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, well, if we're doing a hundred thousand dollars this month, the owner's rich, you know, the owner's just owner just made a hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> they haven't, they haven't felt the pain of a lot of sales and, and losses. Right. Mm -hmm. So it gives you a, a, a way to communicate with the team that feels more specific to what they're doing and less, financial about the way the the owner makes money and it's like hey we've, we we did 12 videos last month how can we do 15 15 would set a record and so now we're starting to operate in a way that can motivate and inspire the whole team it's interesting yeah and i i heard another entrepreneur talk once about how sure. an entrepreneur that shares their profit and loss and their transparency with the team what are your thoughts on that Oh, I love it. I mean, that's open book management. So there's a fantastic book that I would recommend for anyone. 
especially if you're in a struggling uh, business and you think that the, <clears throat> excuse me, that the team may not really understand um, what you're actually going through. Yeah. There's a book called Great Game of Business. And the Great Game of Business is a story about a, an American manufacturing company in a small town. And the, fa the factory was about to go under. The company that owned it was going to shut it down because it wasn't making any money. And a group of the managers convinced the company, instead of shutting it down, sell it to us, which of course the company was going to shut it down. Love that idea because all of a sudden they go from making zero for shutting down a company to making something. And the only way that company survived was by creating what they call open book management. And then they have now become evangelists for this concept of opening up your numbers to your entire team. They show everything. They do kind of what I would call a more extreme version of open book management. It's salaries. It's everything. Everything wow. is on full display. Yeah. And too. it was, yeah, they That's really rare. went for it. And so, yeah, exactly. And so I don't think that necessarily has to be the, the path for everybody, but I think you can have to your level of comfort, you know, but I definitely believe that if your team, and this is kind of what they experienced in this, uh, in this company, in the book, is that the team wasn't sophisticated to understand what it was going to take to survive. And therefore, they weren't sophisticated enough to understand what it was going to take to get ahead and to make sure that everyone's jobs were actually beyond just on the line. Now they're safe. Now we have opportunity for growth. Now we get to get promoted within the company or have room to grow or get salary increases or bonuses or any of the things people always want. And so by teaching them the numbers and showing them what was really happening, it became an educational play within their company and they built their entire culture. So where now we see a lot of companies are using EOS or using some of these methodologies to kind of create a culture and a framework, they did it around their numbers. And every person on the team had a line on the P&L they were responsible for. And so it really became a, a, an element of ownership and th they took that to such a high level, but their team became pros. They, the, the lowest person on the front line understood how to run an entire P&L. And there's a lot of business owners that don't know that. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. I got to read that book. Do you have any other book recommendations on finance or in business that you, you that have made yeah. impact? Yes. I, so I would say I'm a huge fan of Greg Crabtree. Um, he wrote two books. One's called Simp Simple Numbers and the other one's Simple Numbers 2.0. And they each have a, um, a subtitle. But I would say, that, and Greg Crabtree's a CPA, but he, he, he communicates like a business owner because he's also a business owner. Mm -hmm. So I would say that his books are fantastic for getting someone uh, to change their perspective on making money within a company. And so it is written more for the business owner. It's not really a, a way to run the team per se, but a great book for management teams. So maybe you're the head of sales in an organization and you know you don't have it and never had any experience with finance. It's a great book to pick up to go like, okay, I can read this and I'll have at least a strong perspective on you know the way we need to look at our numbers. So I'll definitely uh, look into those books. Now you mentioned pipeline and, and letting you know the team know about like you, you gave an example of you know, telling your team like the video uh, example, um, which I really, I found it very simple. And just talking about projections and the finance and pipelines, do you have any models that you find useful as well with, within your companies? Uh, what do you mean by models? Like financial projections or models. Mm. Yeah. I mean, every, every company should be putting together a, a simple cash flow. We call it a cash flow waterfall. It's as simple as how much do we have in the bank today? You know, we, we look at it, we like to look at it on a weekly basis. So how much is in the bank to start with? How much is going to be exiting the bank this week? How much is going to be coming into the bank? And then where's the new balance going to be? And the, and, and the bottom of this week's cash flow waterfall becomes the top line for next week's. And that's why we kind of say it's the waterfall. You kind of watch it uh, snake through over the coming weeks. And depending on the business and the business model, you know, that's a really, really fascinating way to get people very quickly to see the power of cash management. And without that tool, it's really hard to get someone, even the business owner to understand like delaying a payment a week or getting a customer to pay you a little quicker. Maybe it's, you know, maybe in, in your world, it's, it's moving to a credit card processing company uh, that's going to actually push the cash through faster 
than the one I've been using. Those types of little, seemingly insignificant little tweaks compounded make a massive, massive difference. So that would be the first one is a simple ca uh, cash flow waterfall. The next one that I'd say is I, I like to call it um, the simple profit formula. I always say I want to see how a business can make money on the back of a napkin. And it really goes down to understanding in very simple terms. And I like to look at it in percentages. You know, what is our revenue? So let's say our revenue is a million dollars just for easy math. Then we know what is our cost of goods. It's 20% of revenue. We know that that's our margin, right? That's what everyone obsesses over. That's what, you know, this is very public. But what if we look at any of our additional costs in terms of those percentages? So it could be how much you're sending, spending on sales and marketing as a percentage, how much you're spending on labor as a percentage, other general overhead as a percentage. Because, and the reason I like to do that and the way I like to separate out those categories, certain things are fixed. So in other words, they don't change whether we have more sales or less sales. And some things are truly variable. And so I've got to get those separated out. The minute I have those in my current model and kind of a very simple, like 20% here, 15% here, 30% here, I can then say, what if sales doubled? What would happen? And I can watch, okay, well, this number cost of goods is going to track sales very closely. It's still going to be 20%. It's just going to be twice as much money, right? But my overhead's not going to change at all. And so what you realize pretty quickly is that it's when you have enough volume of revenue coming through your business that your overhead is kind of less and less of a percentage of the total, that's actually how you make money. And it's kind of counterintuitive because it's one of the numbers we don't focus on. It's usually a smaller number. But if you can have, let's say your overhead is 15% of your sales. If it goes down to 5% of your sales, you just made 10% on the bottom line. And so really looking at it as a simple, that simple profit formula, you can start to say, what if it doubled? What if we went down by 50%? You can start to play with it and see what happens and you in immediately grasp kind of the movement of the numbers and the levers and the way you're working with them. Yeah, that's, that's definitely true. Um, my friend did that. She's a, a CPA and she did that for me and she just opened my eyes. She said that like if your margins were increased by 50% uh, and you reduce this uh, the advertising cost, this is how much you make. So it's just shifting and, and it's definitely interesting to have the different um, options there as well. As well. So Yeah. And tracking them over time as a percentage is really powerful because you see, you know, what, what you see is, is that inverse of what I was just talking about. Let's say your overhead is 15%. Your revenue goes down by half. Now all of a sudden your overhead is 30%. Well, you know, you can't survive with 30% overhead. And it, it didn't actually, the number of overhead didn't move, but its relationship with revenue or sales increased dramatically. And that's because you built your business, your overhead structure is built on a certain amount of revenue. If you get less than that, you've got a problem. And so looking at those levers and how they interact with each other, it gives you a really quick understanding of, okay, I have to have a margin of safety here. And, and the last thing I'll add in that sense is think about your pricing. So I don't know if your friend shared that with you, yeah, she said but if the average special. business pricing is everything, if you think about the average business, let's say that you're making 10% on the bottom line. If you were to just increase your, your prices 10%, most people, it, our brains just don't work this way. If you said, well, wait a minute, I was making 10%. You just went up 10% on my prices. What would happen to my profit? Your profit would double the profit would double because that 10% increase in your revenue would drop straight to the bottom line. You were only at 10% before. Mm -hmm. Now the total revenue went up. None of the cost changes. Even your, your margin, your cost of goods don't change in terms of the dollar amount because you raised prices and it drops directly to the bottom line. So thinking about that and understanding how profound that impact is hopefully motivates people to really dig deeper on what does it take to be a premium price? Yeah, oh, that's so true. Let's talk about credit and leverage and because ca cash flow is king, but what is the most strategic way for business owners to leverage credit? You mean in terms of your personal credit or borrowing? Borrowing for business. Okay. Yeah. So borrowing, I mean, again, it's a little bit of what I said earlier in the sense of making sure that you have the right type of credit attached to the right type of use. That's the first one. Um, the next one is, you know, really understand how the bank's or the, the credit uh, institution makes money. 
right? And so when you really understand that and you understand how they look at risk, you understand that they're going to charge you very heavily for risk. And so you need to know that if you're playing in the danger zone with that institution, they're going to penalize you for it and you're going to pay a ton. Right. And so the best, you know, some of these banks, they make a lot of money on the fees for renewing a line of credit and they make a small amount on the line of credit. But a lot of these, like think of the credit card as the easiest example, credit card. If you pay it on time, it costs you nothing, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe there's a little annual fee of $99. But if you, if you don't pay it on time, all of a sudden the interest starts accruing. If you make a late payment, now the interest goes crazy, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. And so that's, they're telling you with the way they structure that pricing, what they value and what scares them. And so just understand that if you're doing something that's scary to where you're getting your credit, it's going to be incredibly expensive to continue borrowing money. Yeah, that, that's so true. So do you think that's the number one threat, financial threat in, in most businesses? Or what are your thoughts? Uh, I think the number one, yeah, I think to me, the the two biggest threats, one is not having a clear picture on whether or not you're actually making money. So it's going back to what we said earlier, you're either not charging yourself a, a salary and then you're lying to yourself about how profitable you are. Or maybe you're just not keeping your numbers organized. And so you get to the end of a month and there's, there is no answer on profit. And so you just keep going. Yeah. So it's going over a prolonged period of time, either not knowing if you're profitable or not being honest with yourself about profit. That's one. The other one is, is really on cash is, fully just running out of money. So if you're not doing some sort of cash projections, if you're not sitting on enough cash, if you're, I see one of the mistakes I see is that someone won't pay themselves and then they'll want to go take money out of the business to go on a vacation, buy a car, put a down payment on a house, whatever it is. All of a sudden they kind of say, well, I haven't been paying myself, so I should be able to take what I need out of the business. And maybe it's, maybe it's rightfully your money to take. I'm not talking about the, whether or not it's a legal or ethical thing. It's really just, it's not smart to then pull resources from the thing that's supposed to make you money. And so we see a lot of people weaken their company dramatically by making that sort of choice. Wow. Yeah. I can imagine that like entrepreneurs would do that. Let's talk about safeguarding finances. How can entrepreneurs safeguard their personal finances while building a business? Yeah, one of them, uh, it's not exciting to talk about, but one of the first things I always say is think about um, the, the kind of fraud protection side of what you're doing. So, you know, safeguard yourself from uh, bad actors who are, are trying to take your money. And that could be, you know, through fraud. It could be through someone in your company making a mistake. And so one of the best ways to do that is thinking about your, your financial institutions you work with. Are you using, you know, boring stuff like password protections? And then, and then there are types of insurance that you can get that are relatively inexpensive that allow you to uh, protect against, you know, one of these scams where somebody wires money the wrong place or someone steals your login. And so that's one of the very first things. Again, it's not exciting to think about, um, and, and so we kind of all avoid it a little bit, but just be smart with the way you're structured and be smart with your employees too. You know, I've one of the uh, unfortunate things in the company that I took over, uh, the very first employee of the company was embezzling from the company. And so I, I caught that person and had to fire them. And the reality was because the way the company was structured, there was no way to get that money back. And what they had done technically wasn't illegal because we'd given them too much authority to move money around. And so when we consulted with lawyers and, you know, authorities and they said, you know, it's kind of borderline here. Like this is, and so just be really smart with how you set up your money and then keep an eye on it. I think those are the most important things to really be safeguarding it is um, so, don't have something but, stupid happen to you. You could have avoided. So just say you wanted to avoid that in the future. What, strategies can you implement in place to prevent that happening again? Well, I think the first one is, you know, you should be the only one who has the ability to move money or you should be the final uh, decision on payments, things like that. And so the structure I like to see, let's say it was just you and one, one employee, they can enter the bills, they can make recommendations for what the payments are. You're the only one who can enter a new vendor. You're the only one who can click the final button to send out payments. And so if you have it structured that way where you have to be the front of the line and the back of the line and they can't edit payment terms, 
because the typical way that you know people are stolen from is that there's payments going to a party they made up you know they made up a vendor that doesn't really exist or you know or they change the banking information or the payment location you know those are the most common ways that people or they just simply you gave them a credit card they know you never look at the statement they go crazy with the credit card that's a really common one so it's just kind of anticipating and again you know believing the best in people but also being smart about your money and just telling people hey I'm, I'm, I, I look, I watch the numbers, you know, it's not anything personal about you. It's just what I believe is good business. And so this is why I do it this way. And so that way you don't have an embarrassing awkwardness around saying, Hey, I need to see what the credit card statement, you know, I need to see what you spent. I need your receipts. Some people build trust with a person and then they feel like they somehow it's a violation of that trust to check up on them. In the reality, it's your your numbers, your money, your business. You just got to be smart. Totally agree. I know you have two more questions left. Um, how would you define, actually three, how would you define success? So I'm a huge believer in entrepreneurship. I absolutely love entrepreneurship. And it's because of that question. You can answer for yourself what success means and no one else in this world can argue you off of that point. Mm -hmm. So success for me is being able to uh, prioritize my family in, in my lifestyle, um, being able to have the time and the energy to kind of do the things that we want to do as a family and spend that time while my kids are still young. Yeah. And then the, the second part is being able to work on projects I'm passionate about where I'm learning every day and I'm getting to kind of develop and build out my career in ways that are interesting to me and with people that I like working with. And so it's really not about a number. It's not about, you know, uh, some certain number of successes or accomplishments. It's really though, if I'm doing those two things, then I'm, I'm very happy. Yeah. That, that seems like um, a very fulfilling way as well. Cause I've heard that from a, a few other guests as well. It's just getting that balance right between family and learning and just it's not all about the numbers. Yep. So I appreciate that. What's one key message yep. you want to leave our audience today? You know, know your numbers, don't run and hide from them. Uh, they're not going away. <laughs> you know, you can't, you can't hide in the closet forever. So, you know, just know your numbers, just realize, you know, and the other thing I like to tell people is think of the, the numbers in your business as a story, you know, understand the story of a product, the story of a job, the story of how the, the work actually flows through. And then hopefully that gives you the context to see the numbers, right? And that's where I like that idea of looking at one video or one unit of measurement that makes sense in your business. But if you understand that the numbers are just a reflection of the story, you typically the business owners understand their story. They just have a hard time. They've never deciphered what the numbers mean and why they, why they tell the story or how they tell the story. Once that clicks in place, then your numbers are really easy to keep up with. So don't hide from them. You know, dig deep, learn what you need to learn. It's part of being a professional. It's part of being an entrepreneur. Um, you just gotta, you gotta push through and, and the better you get at it, the easier it is. And the less you, you time you have to spend obsessing over it, <laughs> you get back to the fun stuff. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Very, very wise words indeed. Uh, this has been really, really helpful and insightful. I hope everyone else found it as valuable as I did. So if you did, please, if you're watching this on YouTube, be sure to hit the like and subscribe button because that helps the channel grow. Finally, where can people find you, Colin? Yeah, I'm easiest to find, I'd say, on LinkedIn. Um, I've been really active on there. Um, and, you know, I'm sure that'll be hopefully in the show notes, uh, a link to that, as well as my website. So um, we help advise people about their numbers, help them make more money. We say we're profitability consultants because that's really what we help drive with the companies is doubling their bottom line. So if, if you want to look me up on my website, finelevate.com, you know, that's the easiest way to uh, book an appointment. And again, even if you're just another entrepreneur, you want to connect, you have a question, there's no pressure. I'm not looking to turn everyone into a client. Um, I love having entrepreneur friends <laughs> that I don't sell to. So um, yeah, I'd love to connect with anybody who's listening, anybody who's watching. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time, Colin. Take care. Thanks.